early contests build momentum for 2024 contenders seeking the White House. C-SPAN offers unfiltered coverage of events leading into early primaries and caucuses. Get access to speeches and results with the free app. C-SPAN now or watch live on the C-SPAN networks. In 2005, two brothers hit the road to chase demons and fight monsters. You know, like you do. After 15 years, they made television history and built a community of dedicated and lasting fans. Sure did. I'm Rob Benedict, and I played God, a.k.a. Chuck Shirley. Yeah, you are, and yeah, you did. And I'm Richard Spade Jr., and I played the Archangel Gabriel, a.k.a. the Trickster, a.k.a. Loki. I also had the privilege of directing a bunch of episodes of the show. Have a few more AKAs, why don't you? Jeez. A.k.a. you're a jerk. Though we've been involved with the series for years and multiple seasons, we never sat down and watched the entire show. Oh, that's not true anymore. Now... We're deep into it. We are going episode by episode and diving in with the folks who made it to bring you an insider's point of view and some great behind-the-scenes stories from the writers, producers, crew, and actors. And you're getting our pure, honest, unfettered reviews. And along the road, let me tell you, we're becoming fans. Buddy, we are super fans. We've heard you saying it for years, and we finally get what all the excitement's about. This show holds up after all this time and deserves to be watched and rewatched. We will be hitting on some spoilers, so consider yourself warned. And if you have any angry emails you want to send, please direct them to Babo. Thank you for joining our journey and listening to Supernatural Then and Now. Hey, everybody, this is Rob Benedict. (laughs) (laughs) You did make this up. Classic. Yeah, let's go ahead and record. So so this podcast will start with (laughs) Benedict. <laughs> That's classic. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Rob Benedict. And I go by the moniker given to me by my parents at birth. And that name is a series of three names, which are Richard Spade Jr. And that's all the time we have, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about season four, episode 12. Chris Angel is a douchebag. Now, what's your uh, what's the title of the episode? Chris Angel is a douchebag. I get you're doing your own little thing about how you don't like Chris Angel, but let's get to the title of the episode. And the title is Chris Angel is a douchebag. Huh. That's all the time we have, everyone. (laughs) Hey, everybody. It's us. We're back. And we want to tell you that you can now find us up on TikTok at SPN Then and Now. That's right. Robbie, you've been doing a lot of TikTok videos for this bad boy? Oh, man. I've been uh, heavy into the... I've been TikToking. I've been talking, I've been ticking. I've been smash burgering. Yeah, same. And we're still on Instagram and Twitter X. Twitter X, which is Twitter only dirtier. That's right. The previous <laughs> Twitter was Twitter in C17. Now That's it's right. Twitter X. Right. That's right. But at least they got the rating. Richard, yeah. shall I tell you what Chris Angel's a douchebag is about? <sighs> yeah, you can bounce uh, bounce a few uh, off the cuff uh, you know, thoughts about the uh, episode. Yeah, it's kind of so in your own words, please. Give me the summary. Okay. So, an up and coming magician dies mysteriously in Sioux City, Iowa during Magic Week, while at the same time, a distraught magician, Jay, performs a death defying trick. Sam and Dean go to investigate. They discovered that the victim had a Ten of Swords tarot card on him when he died. Dean questions two older magicians, Charlie and Vernon, who don't have any information, but say the boys should speak with the chief. Yes, the chief, Robert, the chief. Dean finds the chief only to discover that he's been misled to an S&M leather dom. Mm. That's right. Yeah, a male dominatrix. Meanwhile, Sam is doing research back at the hotel when Ruby shows up. She tells him that he is wasting his time. He should pursue. He should be pursuing Lilith. Lilith. And that the angels are losing while more seals get broken. Sam refuses. Ruby leaves. And later they get married. (laughs) Later that evening, Jay wants to attempt another death-defying trick. The executioner. The executioner. which involves being hung by a noose while in a straitjacket. While attempting the trick, Jay struggles in the straitjacket while hanging. Elsewhere, we see a rope come to life like a serpent and hang a young magician from a ceiling fan. Now, which young magician was that? That was, uh, is that the guy that was making fun of him? Kind of the Chris Angel guy. Oh, it's the Chris Angel guy, that's right. The douchebag, the douchebag. As the magical noose tightens on the victim, Jay is freed. Hmm. 
Mm. So Sam and, Sam and Dean theorize that Jay is using black magic to accomplish his tricks to regain former glory. Wait, Sam, wait. He's he's a black magic. Whoa, man. <laughs> he's a black magic woman. He's a black magic woman. <laughs> Sam wonders if he and Dean st- will still be hunting when they are old men. Dean tells him that their lives will likely end bloody or sad. Well, thanks for the upbeat <laughs> prediction there, Dean. <laughs> Sam asks if Dean would end the demon war if he could. Dean wonders if Sam is hiding anything. Sam denies it. Wow. Great conversation, guys. Mm-hmm. Both of you just full of it. Really? Yeah. I couldn't help but think in that moment that Sam does live a long life, but Dean does not. Uh, I couldn't help but think the same thing, except for I didn't know that because you just ruined it for me. Thanks a lot. All right. Sorry, I keep forgetting you didn't watch the finale. The brothers find out that the latest victim had a tarot card on his body at the time of death, too. Sam and Dean confront Jay about using black magic. Jay Whoa, man. It. Yeah. Jay-, <laughs> Jay denies it and has the brothers arrested. Later, Jay tells his close friend, Charlie, that he doesn't know how he's going to do the death-defying magic. That's not what he says. Later, Jay tells his close friend, Charlie, that he doesn't know how he's doing the death-defying magic. Right. Charlie encourages him to continue. Keep doing it, man. That evening, Jay makes a second attempt at the table of death trick. This time, his friend Charlie is the one to die. Oh, no. Jay gets the boys released from jail and asks for their help in investigating what is going on. Jay accuses his friend Vernon of doing something nefarious. 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 Jay accuses his friend Vernon of doing something nefarious. Vernon denies it. In the middle of the confrontation, a young Charlie interrupts them and admits to the shenanigans. Oh, no, not to the shenanigans. Charlie has been alive since the times of P.T. Barnum, the great showman of the mid-1800s. Well, yeah, Hugh Jackman. We all know who that is. Yeah, yeah. Charlie reveals that Barnum gave him a collection of spells, a grimoire, that contain a spell for immortality. Charlie offers eternal life to Jay and Vernon, but Sam and Dean must die. That seems like a fair trade. Yeah. Jay uses a sleight of hand trick, steals the enchanted tarot cards, and kills Charlie using a trick. Later, Sam and Dean arrive at a bar to speak with a depressed Jay. They try to thank him for doing the right thing. Jay questions if it is the right thing, that one friend died, another left him, and now he must live a lonely life. It's a bummer that his other friend left him. That seemed like, well, that's That's, not cool. That's a real tragedy. Yeah. Later, Sam privately meets with Ruby and says he's changed his mind. He doesn't want to be an old man hunting monsters. Uh huh. And that's it. That's the end of the app. End of the episode. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, that lots like to. Yeah. So did I tell you that I uh, I, I I did a, a movie? I once did a scene with Michael Weston, uh, who's the real life son of uh, John uh, Rubenstein, which is awesome, and, and plays him as a young man in this. And he uh, went to Northwestern. He's a Northwestern grad. What was the movie you did with him? A movie called State of Play. I, I had huh. a small part and we had a whole bit together. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go into my review. I really loved the, the episode. What really made it for me was these three actors that they got to play these three roles. They're just, they're, they're classic, uh, like you said, veteran actors. Oh, journeyman. journeyman. Journeyman, to be sure. And they're just, it was fun to see those pros. I kept thinking like, oh, wow, that must have been a big steal at the time. Like, and maybe it's me because I grew up in the 80s, but I was like, Barry Bostwick. That's awesome. I thought it was cool. I, I, I think you are correct in, in, in noting how awesome that is. And I kind of like magic. So uh, I like the magic part of it. I like that it was a little bit different of an ending than we normally get, where it wasn't necessarily a happy ending. Yeah, correct. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I always love when Ruby's in it and, you know, kind of watching the ongoing thing of what's happening over there with Sam and Ruby. Yeah, and it was it was a good it was a good twist because you think oh you know you you get misled two different ways you think it's Barry Boswick doing it and then you're like oh no it's this other guy doing it and then you're like oh, yeah no, this this whole time it was John Rubenstein and yeah in, an immortality trick the old immortality trick the so, old uh, one two uh, you're still alive trick yeah so I I enjoyed it this I think this so it's such a good season um but yeah. Rich, what did what did you really think I think the casting of the three veteran guys makes the episode Barry is awesome it's richard libertine whose work i was super familiar with because yeah. i was corrected in our interview which i think airs after this but i it think it's was, Liber- i think he's libertini i think that's how he's libertini said. okay sorry but he's like in fletch and in 
all of me and just has done a ton of movies. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was amazed that he was part of the cast and not even the main guest star of the week. It was that Barry. And then these supporting guys were just, you know, super successful guys. It was great. It was really, really, you know, cool and elevated the whole episode. And the, and the guy who played uh, Chris Angel, the Chris Angel type at least was really good. He was good. Yeah. He, he got that, did that well. Yeah. So I just, I enjoyed the whole thing. I thought, I thought, and I also was a fan of magic. I love that they kept showing us tricks. They, you know, the, we were seeing some of the magic that was going on. I thought that made it really fun. Yeah, totally. Agree uh, on all those counts. Where are you on the beard monitor? The beard. Level. I am going to say that this is the Kenny Rogers. I think oh, it's wow. a really solid episode. I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, I, I reserve Stapletons for the ones that I think are just absolutely perfect in every way. And I, it's not like I don't think this one is, there's nothing I can point at and go, I didn't like this. I liked everything about it. I thought it was really good, really solid, really fun, well acted, uh, well written. Yeah. So it's, it's, getting a, it's getting a solid solid review for me in the form of, yeah. a, of the Kenny Rogers. Yeah. I really love this episode. I just wanted to sort of do an homage to the episode and give a, a real classic, because it's got these three classic actors. Yeah. So I want to give a, a real like classic beard. So I'm going to go with, how about the Dan Haggerty? I'm going to do the Dan Haggerty. Dan Haggerty, Grizzly Adams? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I thought you were going to whip out the name of a bearded magician. Like you're going to give this the Gallagher or something like, I, you know, I guess he's not a magician. The Doug Henning, the Doug Henning. Did he have a beard? No, he just had a big mustache. That's yeah. what I thought. Um, yeah. Ma magician beard. Yeah. A lot of mustaches with magicians. I mean, my second option was the Billy Gibbons, uh, just cause you know, from ZZ top. Yeah. Uh, we know that was, a, um, that was a long, well, uh, you but, know, interestingly, the only Man. member of uh, ZZ Top without a beard was the drummer, Frank Beard. That's right. That's so, right. that's the um, hill Frank Gibbons had yeah. glorious beards, however. so And then I, I, I and the most famous beard of all, your wife. <laughs> exactly. I thought there was definitely a, a beard joke in there waiting to come out there. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I'll give it to Dan Haggerty, meaning it's a great beard, it's a full beard, and it's classic. These guys it's, have it's, been, befri it's befriended a bear named Ben. And it's befriended a bear named Ben. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's awesome. So you got a Kenny Rogers and a Dan Haggerty. Strong reviews to get us back in the saddle, as it were. That's right. We resume our podcasting of Supernatural Then and Now, a rewatch podcast that you're currently listening to on this station. <laughs> so stay tuned. Stay uh, tuned for the hits. Because next up, we've got a, another a great interview. Great, uh, such, such an interview. We've already done it, so we know how yeah. great it is. So we're going to go right into that right now. Everyone, it's always a treat to have with us executive producer, often director, and showrunner. I mean, showrunner. And really just the backbone of the show, uh, our good friend, Mr. Robert Singer. Hi, Bob. Hi, guys. How are you? I feel like if people don't know Bob by now, they're just re listening to the wrong podcast. They are. Yeah. Okay. So what's the story behind the title? Was it a funny idea to, to say Chris Angel is a douchebag? Or was it, it was rumored to be inspired by bits from the Kevin and Bean show where they talked about their constant teasing of, of Chris Angel? Uh, I, I, that I don't know. This is okay. the first I've heard that. I, I always just thought that Eric had it in for Chris Angel for some, for some reason. <laughs> that's, what I, yeah. that's what I assumed, yeah. It, it just sounds like a, a Kripke thing to say. No, it was, it was definitely Kripke, yeah. I was yeah. surprised that we could use it and then actually – refer to it in dialogue in the, in the show. Yeah. You know? It's funny that they, that that cleared. Yeah. I would know. I was surprised, but uh, you know, maybe somebody's asleep at the wheel. I don't know, but we, you know, talking about the, 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 the sort of Chris Angel guy that we were using and, you know, he was referred to, I think three or four times as what a douchebag. And I'm going, geez. Yeah, I know. You know could we get away with <laughs> that? Know. But I guess we could. I know. It wasn't subtle. It was this not is not subtle, one of those man. ones where we had to sort of dust it off and look beneath the surface to see what was really being said here. And maybe Chris Angel is just a sweetheart. We know we don't know. He's a, maybe I he's, have no you know, idea. I've never met no him. No idea. I, you know, but you know, wherever Kripke wants us to go, that's where we would go. That's where you go. 
It would be kind of funny if Chris Angel does a magic show sometime in the future called Eric Grippy is a pompous <laughs> jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so at one point in the process, did you cast these classic uh, actors? Um, yeah, dude. Barry Boswick, Richard Libertine, uh, John Rubenstein. I-, I had worked with uh, Richard many years ago, and, and I <laughs> it was on a failed pilot that I directed. It was one of those things you had to put out of your mind, that particular pilot. It was... It was one of those jobs you kind of take for the money, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, you know, they, they, their names came up with casting, you know, and, and I said, God, it would be so great to be able to have all three, you know. And as you guys know, rarely would we bring three actors from from California up. But I sort of cajoled and said, God, I really want this. And, you know, I did my Bobby Wine thing, which sometimes works. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it was a treat. It was really a treat. And th- three just great professionals, you know, just a pleasure to work with. I hung out with Boswick on the set a lot. He's really a sweet guy. I really love Barry. He was terrific. Oh, cool. And you, you didn't know him be- before, so you didn't have a history with Barry. But other than just working one day with Richard Libertini, I, I didn't know any of them. Oh, my God. I was always a admirer of John Stein. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as an actor, but he also, along with Tim McIntyre, did the music for um, the Robert Redford Mountain Man uh, movie. Oh, you know, anyway, he he wrote a wonderful score. He and Tim McIntyre. Tim Tim sang the song in the uh, in the movie, and I always thought, God, it was so cool. And I guess John's father is just a well known uh, composer. Composer, yeah, yeah. Jeremiah Johnson. Jeremiah Johnson. Jeremiah, Jeremiah Johnson. Johnson there right. you go. I saw John in a a play. I mean, he's a great theater actor as well. I saw him in a musical. Back when Century City had that had that the theater and plays would come through, right? Yeah. But regardless, you end up with this all star cast, which you're right is a is a challenge in itself, just in terms of getting everybody up to L.A. Be- Barry Boswick is a is inspired casting. Did that come from uh, Robert Ulrich? Yeah, I think these were just names that Ulrich had given us, sort of his um, you know wish list. Mm-hmm. But the, you know, to get three well known actors to come up and do this thing, and for us to kind of wrangle the uh, the idea that we could actually afford it was uh, it was really special. I mean, I was I was in heaven with those three guys. It was great. Yeah, I bet. I, I thought I was watching it. I was like, oh, I bet Bob's worked with Bostwick before. You know, and, and his his performance is really terrific too. He like really plays that really well. It's almost kind of a sad character, you know, um, who's found this this newfound ability. And then Michael Weston, a uh, Northwestern graduate, plays young Charlie, the son of John. In, in real life, he's the son of John Rubenstein. He plays him as a young, young person in this. Do you remember the the cat that beh- behind that casting? Was it John's idea or? I think it was John's idea. Um, I think uh, I think maybe Robert brought it up, and um, and I think we actually read him, and he was great. Yeah, he's a good actor. Yeah, he really a, a very nice actor, and I thought he did a wonderful job in that in the scene that he had there. That day was brutal. Really? Oh, it was just Jensen was um, Jensen hated hanging there, and I kept you know he would put him down, and then I'd have him like in the background of a shot, and he got I gotta hang again. I mean, oh, wow. I thought I was through hanging. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you fake a hanging like that? Uh, you, you, you put a halter on them, so they're basically being suspended by a by a, a halter around the chest and whatever. Sure. So all the right. pressure is not, it's not on the neck. It's got it. But it's a pain in the neck. I mean, you're still hanging in the air, you know. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And Richard didn't have a lot to do that day, um, and he got a little cranky at the end of the day because I hadn't finished him out. But, you know, you're trying to shoot this, you know, in segments where you can work your way around for lighting. And uh, it was, uh, but, and I was sick as a dog that day, I remember. I had a really oh, no. cold. So it, the, I thought the scene turned out just fine, but I was, that was not a happy camper that day. Wow. Well, the scene's great, man. The scene's great. God, that's got to be a lot of pressure, too. You're like wrangling all those people, the stars of your show, and then these three men who are like just, you know, just classic working veterans. Actor, of the veterans yes. And you're not feeling well. I can't even imagine. It was a um, it was a tough day, but you know, it's such a maybe a generational thing. You never had to look for Richard or John or Barry. They were there on set the whole day. 
You know, it was not like going back to the trailer and then have to call them out. They were just, I right. mean, between takes, I would, I remember I would just sit and I would have fun conversations with Barry. He was next to me the entire day. Um, That's amazing. You know, it was just sort of the, you know, the old pro way of doing things. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, I sometimes I wonder, like, what did we, you know, my, when I started in the business, like, we didn't we didn't have cell phones. So you right. sat around and talked to people, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they, just, they just don't do that anymore. Well, that's been a, you know, and, and listen, obviously they have their worth, but, you know, I can remember going on lo- location scouts years ago. Maybe one person had a, a radio, you know, that they could talk over to talk to somebody that they needed to talk to. But there was a lot of discussion in in the van, you know, about what we're going to do and whatnot. It wasn't that everybody was on their cell phone doing something else, you know. And a lot of it clearly, I mean, it was work-related. And, and Jerry Wanick certainly used his cell phone to a great advantage because he was always, you know, looking ahead to the next show and all that. But I kind of, uh, I, I sort of miss that, you know. But, you know, I go far back back where we'd all go and watch dailies together. So. Right, right, right. When dailies wow. were actually dailies. Right. So uh, did did uh, Barry have a hand model a magician doing the sleight of hand stuff? Yes, yeah. He'd cut, whoever was doing the, that magic trick was obviously an expert. Yeah, and there was a, uh, I, I remember I stole a shot out of uh, this, the, uh, this thing where Paul Newman is doing a lot of fancy stuff with the cards. And then there's one shot where he kind of screws up, right? And, and, and you tilt up to him, you know, which really gives the illusion that you were seeing the guy really do it. So that, that was that was a direct steal from the sting of that. Oh, cool. That's cool. It's a, it's a good homage. Good, good place to pull a, a steal. Ah, from. It's one of my favorite movies. This may be complete coincidence, but did, you know, the, the character Boston plays is Jay and, and as, a music, as a magician. I just wondered if that was any kind of nod to Ricky Jay or any, or anything like that. Uh, I don't know. I didn't write the script. Um, it could have been. It just made it made me think that the whole time, just because of his. Yeah. Well, that's you know, yeah. Why not? <laughs> sure. We'll go, we'll go, yes. <laughs> were you, Were you into magic as a kid? Was magic a thing? I, you know, it's not a big thing for me, but I've always enjoyed ma- magicians. Uh, you know, when I would get to see someone, I go, "Wow, that's really cool." And I went through a very brief period of time where I sort of got into different magic tricks. It didn't last very long, but I'm I, I am pretty handy with a deck of cards and can do card tricks. But uh, that's cool. Yeah, well, that's good. That does not surprise that's, me. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, if I ever see you guys in person, other than you know on a on a picket <laughs> line, I'll uh, I'll bring a deck of cards <laughs> and show you a couple tricks. <laughs> yeah, not so conducive. Uh, yeah, while circling Warner Brothers. <laughs> no, uh, zoom zooms and picket lines. That's what our relationships have become. <laughs> well, I can say you you had. Like this is definitely an homage to sort of a different style and time. Even the Boston's character is sort of reflecting back on the on on the his, you know the old days, as it were, and this sort of the old guard versus new guard of magic. And and you also in the same season did the monster movie, and it sort of references to Universal Monster. There's like there's a nostalgia element to this episode in a way that also permeates the the monster movie one. And I'm curious if that is. You do a great job tapping into that in both instances, and obviously they're in the script. But how much of that resonates with you as, her, as somebody who enjoys that era? Like, were these were those fun journeys to go on as a filmmaker? Uh, yeah, well, I enjoyed the, this one, you know, and I, and I thought Barry, you know, th- that hairstyle we gave him was was, was so kind of fifties, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, like, yeah, quaff. That's awesome. Um, in this episode, the the magic tricks that that he uses, the table of death, the executioner. Do we have any idea if those are real tricks? No, I think Julie made those up. Uh, you know, they they did just sounded dangerous and yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And I thought that would that worked pretty well. You know, and you know, obviously you could do a lot of cheating with the camera, but when you actually see the things come down, you know, and the audience reacts, it's uh, it, it is kind of cool. Yeah, you know? it is. It is. It, it really really, cool. really worked every time. Ahoy, Rich Spade here. Hope you're enjoying the episode, but we got to pull over for a second for some messages. Early nominating contests build momentum for 2024 contenders seeking the White House. C-SPAN is the place for political campaign enthusiasts. 
with unfiltered coverage surrounding the early primaries and caucuses, as well as speeches from key battleground states. Whether you're interested in your state's race or want to follow all of the political events, you can get immediate access to what the candidates are saying, plus nominating results in real time with the free mobile app. C-SPAN now or watch live on the C-SPAN networks. Thanks for listening. Now back to the episode. We have written here that the chief scene is hilarious. You know what the chief scene is? The chief scene is, is they, Jensen is, goes and talks to the three guys and they don't give him much information, but they tell him to go to a, a certain address that he can get some. Oh, yes, 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 and it's yes, this yes. back alley thing, you know, right. and it's, you know, it's a safe Some kind of S&M. Thing, you know, yeah. guy asks yeah. me a safe word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that was such a funny... Yeah. Switcheroo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was that was fun, you know. And uh, and you know, and Jensen goes back to see them, right? And the guy you say, you know, listen, we're in the business, you know, you're pawning off, you know, some, some fake FBI idea that's not gonna work. You know? Yeah. Uh another one good one is when they're they've tied up uh, Barry Bostwick and they're having a they're a tete a tete on the other side of the room, and then you kind of circle around with the camera, and Barry's gone. Like, ah, oh, we should have guessed. Like he he got out of the ropes. Right. Like he's a magician. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that yeah. was a cool shot too. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it was a f- super fun episode, I, and I love the magic elements of it. That you know, I know you're using trickery for for everything, but it just was fun. And you know, even that opening shot of like some guy street magician magician doing something. Just cool stuff. Yeah, it was. It, it was fun to do, and you, you know, the card uh, when, when the Chris Angel characters is doing the street side thing, and the card sticks to the window. Yeah, that was cool. If I told you how simple that was, I said, "Really? really? This is the way we do that? This is what they do?" It was, wow. Yeah, you need an accomplice, and uh, yeah, and <laughs> there's just like a fly swatter right and it's again again they're just a misdirection thing and you just you hit this fly swatter onto the window and the card sticks but you never see the fly swatter thing it's uh yeah oh really yeah really so somebody as part of the the act does it like it's not the chris angel well we don't so. ever see that but that's the way we really did it um wow i assume that would be maybe the way magicians would do that with an assistant because, you know, we, we had a magician who was, a, you know, a, a technical advisor and he was said, this, this is the way we're, we would get that done. So I'm sure that's probably the way some version of that in, you know, in real magic acts. Must have been fun having a, a magician on set for the week. Yeah, it was that fun. Yeah, cool. yeah. You know, so a lot of the stuff we did, you know, it was fun to do. I was also, you know, I hadn't watched this thing in forever. So I'm always... I, I, I tend to be critical of my direction. You know, I see things I go, that ah, I wish I'd done it that way or, you know, or, or whatever. And then I see things I go, wow, that was pretty well done. So revisiting these things is always interesting to me. Um, yeah, I bet. You know. What stuck out to you in both sides, positive and negative, about this one? Well, you know, sometimes you, you think back and you say, God, I was really crunched for time and I shot it in a way that got the, the scene done but it was not necessarily as elegant as I might like. The last scene in the uh, in the theater, which has so many elements to it, you know, I remember dropping shots that I wanted to do that were kind of cool just to kind of be able to get the story told. And again, I wasn't feeling well that day, so I don't think I was totally uh, on top of my game. I, I, I thought there was probably a nicer, a little more elegant way to shoot that. As I looked at it now, I said, well, that worked. That was fine. The, the the shot that uh, you brought up, Rob, uh, where um, Boswick disappears. Yeah, I like that. I thought that was well done. So it was great. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, uh, some some scenes some are almost easier to tell the story than others, where you got you know six people in the scene and you have to cover all these different ways. It's it's so complicated, you know. Yeah, you know, and you're gonna do it for. You know, if you were making a movie, it would take three days to do, and sure. you know, and we're doing it right. in, 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 After- in one day. The theater was yeah, cold. Right. It was, the whole thing was not, not pleasant. But wow, everybody came up. You know, we got the game speed, and uh, you know, I, I think it it, it worked well. Uh, yeah, it does. You, that, it's sort of those inside baseball things that, as a viewer, you would never know. It's because it, the scene plays great. And so, you know, it's it's interesting hearing someone of your experience and skill level talk about the shots they don't get. Because there's so many great shots in the episodes that obviously to the viewer, we don't leave missing anything. 
you just know what you left on the table. Right, right. And that's yeah. kind of an interesting, interesting perspective. You know, and I, I imagine Martin Scorsese probably says, God, I wish I would have gotten this, you know? <laughs> sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you know, Phil told that funny story about, I guess, maybe it was on uh, one of your shows, by one of the shows you executive produced, but uh, Eric Lanable, like, he was he was swapping spots with Eric Lanable. Like, you know, he was turning over in midday. Eric was done with an episode and Phil was a young director. And he said that as he was passing Eric Lanable and <laughs> Eric Lanable was like, prepare to be disappointed. <laughs> like, you know, just as he's going into another day of work. I'm like, sure that was that not going to get it all. Probably a midnight caller. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of insert shots in this uh, episode of ropes, hands, walls of spikes, tarot cards. kind of know the answer to this, but I want to hear you say it. Is How much of those are covered by the director and how much of those are, are sort of a, the camera breaks off? And I guess specifically, how much of that is improv? You know what? I might want a shot of the, the hands here or is that or is the ways you, that you do it, it's all pretty mapped out what you want to get? It's, it's pretty mapped out. I think, you, you know, you I'm I don't know, kind of the way I do it. I, I, I think a lot of guys don't just because maybe I'm lazy, but I really play scenes in my head when I'm reading the script and I, 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 just, I just play them in my head. And so I have all these shots in my head. I, you know, my notes are very sparse. I mean, if you look at Phil's notes as compared to my notes, you know, mine look, I mean, the guys always used to tease me where they would take my script and, you know, and I have like stick figures and little <laughs> arrows going places, but that's, <laughs> you know, but so, I, you know, I have this film running in my head and I get the shots from that film. That's just, I mean, that's the best way I can explain it. Yeah. Yeah. This seemed very specific though. I mean, specifically the magic going on in this episode, it felt like, I mean, I, I don't know if we decided it's all shot by you, Bob, but it felt like it was because it, it all felt character driven. It felt like, you know, they're looking down and the hands are doing something. It all was very specific and had to match the moment, if, if you will, you know? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think you're right there, you know, and, and, and when you're including sort of the, this, this magic stuff in it, it has to really be seamless. So if I can't, you know, I know where the where the hands are going to go when, when we cut it or what, what my intent was. Um, so I think in this case, it was really important that I kind of did everything because you're you're trying to fool the audience you know, with basically camera tricks. So, you know. And then we're, so we're in the, we're in the middle of season four and the monster of the week thing is still heavily part of the show, but Ruby and other reminders continue, continue to pop up about Lilith and the 60, 66 seals. Is that season arc mapped out before the individual monsters of the episodes, individual monster episodes are written? In other words, at the end, at the beginning of the season, do you guys go, okay, this is where the boys are. This is where we want them to get to by the end. And then you go back in and go, ooh, and we'll have an episode where they do this, and they'll do that, they'll do that, you know? We, we would basically do a half season. We, we would go and, you know, we would set the template and who the characters were for that, and we would do a half season. And then we would have a meeting at, you know, mid, mid-year and figure out what, what the end was. Our cliffhangers were... Uh, <laughs> We would do cliffhangers, not knowing where we we're going to start the next year. We, you know, we, right? That's awesome, we, right? Or, or how we were going to get out of the cliffhanger. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they didn't bring cliffhangers really cool, so we'll just do that and then figure out the rest later. <laughs> yeah, uh, like bringing Dean back to life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's a well, way to make it exciting. You know, swing without a net, as they say. <laughs> but when Sarah left the show and she wrote the last episode uh, before she before she left, and that had uh, Dean and Cass stuck in purgatory it was a really cool thing they both got stuck in purgatory and then we see dean in purgatory and he's looking for Cass, and he Cass is nowhere to be found and i went wow that's that's really a cool cliffhanger but <laughs> sarah's leaving leaving us with trying to figure out how to get out of there you know right yeah right. yeah hilarious wow thanks a lot sarah <laughs> well you know the the it's always interesting because some of these especially this story gets so involved you get so wrapped up in those characters that I actually like that the through line takes a backseat to some of these. I, I mean, I guess they're called Monster of the Week episodes, but these episodes where the guest stars are the stars. You know, you know this big story of Barry and the magic and the journey and his history and all that kind of stuff. And the boys come in to sort of resolve it. But you really get sucked up into these episodes and the subplot, which is the bigger arc of the season, sort of stands down for an episode or two. And I think that's was helpful in Supernatural keeping its 
the idea that they're going to be solving these issues as they go along. You know what I mean? It never, they never forgot what they're supposed to be doing on the road. Right. right. You know, in the middle of the season, which I like. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, we would, we'd just try to keep the Uber story alive and just give it a nod in any particular episode, which I think the, the fans probably were interested in. But then, you know, in our standalones, it, it, it was always we wanted the the guest stars or the guest villain, the guest monster to have their own story. You know, Eric used to say uh, every villain is the hero of his own story. And we, we tried to live by that, you know, just give them their own story. And, uh, you know, and sometimes they were vulnerable. Sometimes they were just so awful. But they had, but you know, but they had an agenda. Mm-hmm. And I think. Yeah, and this led to like, you know, there was definitely things that, were, you know, led right back to the themes that Sam and Dean were fighting with. You know what I mean? About like, what what is Sam going to do for his brother and that kind of thing? Because Harry has that whole sequence at the end. He's like, he was like a brother to me and now he's gone. I got a girl by myself and all that stuff. It definitely, you know, brought us back to where we had been. If you, if, if you, yeah, will. I thought that, um, I love that last scene. Very simple, but Barry was so good in it. And, he, you know, you really felt for the guy. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I, I mean, he's a really talented actor because, as we know, you know, he can do comedy. And I was watching this thing again. He, he really touched me. <laughs> I got to say, yeah, he's great. Very much so. Yeah, very much so. Um, this is an interesting ending to this one, too, because the parties aren't entirely grateful for Sam and Dean's involvement. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the last thing we have for you is, uh, so the boys drive a 67 Impala. Bobby drives a 71 Chevelle SS. In the final scene of this episode, we see Ruby driving her 1970 Mach 1 Mustang. Are there no reliable Hondas or sensible Subaru Outbacks? <laughs> <laughs> No modern cars to be had in that uh, <laughs> series of towns. Well, I think Ruby kind of feels that Sam's very comfortable in that car. So that's a cool car. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting night. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. We shot. Go on. I don't know. We shot the night. We shot Jensen going into the uh, the Bleecker Street place for the, uh, you know, the your safe word place. Uh, uh-huh. We shot that exterior and we shot. Uh, Jared getting into uh, Ruby's car. And that was the night work. The day work was in the Patricia Hotel where, you know, where like Barry calls the cops and, and all that upstairs stuff. So that was a kind of a full day. We got through it pretty well. And now we we needed dark. So uh, we were going to have a little bit of a uh, downtime. So Jared and Jensen went to uh, that uh, steak place, that famous steak place hmm. in Vancouver. The name is escaping me now. Gotham? That Gotham, was- yes. Thank you. <laughs> and now we're waiting for them while they're enjoying their scotches and their steaks. And, and so by the time they came back up, I was a little unhappy with them. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. You know, they, they, they came a tad late. Uh-huh. Um, and I was giving Jensen what for about that, you know, and I said, you know, and it was, it was a Friday, you know, and, you know, you guys know, you know, we used to have those Friday days and we had a real shot to get out of there before midnight on a Friday, which would have been rare. Wow. Big news. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I was giving Jensen what for about that. And I said, you know, you ought to really apologize to the crew and blah, blah, blah. So he kind of gave a half apology and we shot his thing and it was real quick. And then I'm, I'm walking away and Jared started getting on me about, uh, you know, how they're always there on time and, you know, and I shouldn't be blah, 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 you know, <laughs> and I just lost it with him you know <laughs> I just, really yeah i said i said hey i wasn't talking to you <laughs> you know b you're not always here on time so listen let's just shoot this and have a nice weekend and we'll all reconvene on monday but you know, i don't i don't need your shit tonight so <laughs> <laughs> I, that's why it's great to have a bob around because there's not a lot of people who a lot of people would have been like okay i hear you yeah okay <laughs> filing that one away and you're like, not not singer, man, not Bob. No, no, sir. That ain't going by. It's, it's, it's dad and a couple sons, you know. Yeah, I know. Sometimes, That's what I'm the, sometimes the sons need the what for. You know what I mean? Darn right. You got to give they them do. the what for. Time to go to the woodshed. Uh-huh. Well, this would be uh, th- th- this would be off topic, so it's not it's not, it's not supernatural. But s- sometimes if we're all having a a, a beer somewhere, uh, I'll tell you a Gary Busey story that I had. Oh boy! Oh man, I am in. I've got I've got a couple of Gary Busey stories. I, I don't have any Gary Busey. I didn't. Stories. Oh, you're you're lucky, Rich. Busey. Believe me. <laughs> God. All right. Yeah, it's a different kind of insanity. Right. All right. Good. Good to know. File that one away for next time. Yeah. Um, Bob, thank you so much for doing this, man. I mean, truly, nobody has the insight you have. It's awesome. 
It's so fun. I appreciate that, you. I appreciate that, guys. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Hey, this is Jensen. I hope you're enjoying the episode. Uh, but we need to pull over for a second for some messages. And I got to take a leak. Hey there, thanks for listening. Now, back to the episode. Hey, that was great. Bob, classic as always. And you know, of the Bob interviews, it was one of the best. God, I love hearing from Bob in any way, shape, or form about anything. What a, what a knowledgeable fellow, but just effing funny. <laughs> funny, just, and I mean, the, the story about the boys at the end, too, is so classic. It's so classic, great. all three of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because it really is a dad and two sons. Cause like it's it's the strict dad who's like, hey, apologize to everybody. And then Jensen gives a half-assed apology, his words. And then yeah. Jared goes, and then Jared goes, Hey, you, you can't talk to him like that. We come we work hard. <laughs> and, then, and then and then Bob's like, all right, we're out just go home for the weekend. I like I like Bob said first of all, I said, I'm not talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> talking to your brother. Like you're not going to get it. You're nobody's going to intimidate Bob. Singer. God, he re- God, God, he reminds me of you and the way you're going to be in 30 years and 30, the whole, like, 30 minutes. Yeah, I gave him the what for. I mean, how no one says that anymore? That's so great. Uh, so I gave him the what for. That's, I, but I, think I, what for. I think I say that actively now. I think this you day. probably do. Like it's just a classic way of talking. I guess I was giving him the what for, and then the other one comes up, and you know. Well, first of all, I'm talking to you. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, so great. All um, right, let's uh, let's get into something in this program that we do on the reg, and uh, it's a segment that we segue uh, into from where we are right now, and it's, it's called... got a title that is simple and explanatory, and it okay. is this mythology, mythology, tarot cards. Tarot cards were originally invented in Italy in the 1430s and were designed for card games. They were often an added suit to a standard playing card deck, superior in power to the standard suits. You know what they called them in Italy? What? A tarot card. A tarot. A tarot card. A tarot card. <laughs> Instead of a standard suit mark, the tarot card each had a different allegorical illustration, likely dating back to ancient Roman celebrations and customs. The number of cards and suits in the tarot deck evolved over the centuries and in different cultures. Their adoption for use in the occult and fortune telling didn't occur until late in the 1700s in France, or as they say in France, en France. We oui. Oh, that, that's interesting. I never knew that. Never Neither knew that. that at all. I kind of thought they were made to be part of the fortune telling world. I didn't know they were in regular playing cards. And so, what is a grimoire? Uh, it's like an armoire, right? But it's got a—it's just always mopey, right? Right. It's really grim. And like there's a sad sack of an armoire. Yeah, I have a really nice grimoire in my. I got I have my shirt. Today. I don't like going in there because every time I I go to get a shirt, it says, "Hey, <laughs> what are you doing?" I'm like I'm gonna grab a shirt and go out. No, I wish I could do that. Well, in reality, it's just. But a I'm fancy. a piece of furniture. I can't. It's just me, your grimoire. <laughs> That's where I keep my black shirts, my rainy day clothing. Exactly. But in reality, it's just a fancy word for a spell book or a book of magic. Ah. The, wor- the word has its roots in Europe, but refers to texts from varying cultures and regions. Some of the more popular grimoires include the sixth and seventh book of Moses. I liked one, two, three, not a fan of four, five, and I actually liked eight, six and seven. A bit grim for me. I feel like they could have done it all in six. They didn't need to divide it in two books. Well, but they were making money for each uh, printing, you know what I'm saying? So this is definitely a a cash grab. True. Uh, The Clavicle of Solomon, which, by the way... Ah, one of my favorites. If you haven't seen Solomon's Clavicle, you're missing a trick. (laughs) Um, The fourth book of occult philosophy. Again, one, two, and three are just time killers to get you to four. Yeah. But I, I bailed out it too, so I never even got to this occult philosophy. This is when they started doing a lot of drugs and kind of their experimental phase. Exactly. And then there's the Book of Shadows, which if you open it up, it's just a bunch of dumb shadows. And if you watch, if you look at the book in bright light, like in the sun, there's nothing on the page. So it's really dumb. And then a little <laughs> nickname that Rob actually had in college, Petite Albert. Uh, Petite Albert. Petite, <laughs> Petite little Albert. Um, 
Well, that's that's exciting. Well, this is going to lead us right into we're having fun, and so it's time for fun facts. This episode had a few different tentative titles, including Ace Up My Sleeve and Magic Me. Those are not nearly as good as Chris Angel's The Douchebag. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I, I can't believe, like Bob said, I can't believe it got through. Uh, yeah, shocking, but, you yeah. know, kudos. Glad yeah. somebody's asleep at the wheel. Um, the characters Vernon and Charlie are named after two famous magicians, Di Vernon and Charlie Miller. Hmm. In their later years, the two frequently performed at the Magic Castle in Hollywood, California. Yeah. Have you ever seen Magic at the Magic Castle? I have. It's awesome. I have not. And it's like, I, I can't believe it. I've, I've been what? invited and I haven't been able to go the times I've been invited. And I've Oh, you got to go, go, man. Yeah. Uh, help, me, uh, help me do that, Rich. Help I'll me. help you help me help yourself. Uh, Michael Weston, a uh, Northwestern graduate, who played young Charlie, is the son of John Rubenstein and... Uh, you know, John Rubenstein, of course, played the older Charlie, Charlie and the Magician. So got to be the are, first time in supernatural history that uh, an actual father played an actual father of the character. Wait a minute, that's what I mean. A father and son work together. Yeah, yeah. Young Charlie, he played the young version of John. Um, and so, yeah, that's. Uh, I know Michael at some West. point uh, Jensen Ackles' dad is in an episode. Mr. Oh, Ackles. really? Yeah, but is, I so that happens. Is, but is he yes. related to Dean at all in that? I don't know. I guess we'll find out when we get there. Okay. Dean quotes the Who song, My Generation, when he says... Who? Dean quotes the Who song. Who song is it? The Who. When he says... Yeah, yeah, no, wait, what is it again? The Who. Who? The Who. <laughs> That's all the time we have, everyone. Uh, the Who song, My Generation, when he says, I hope I die before I get old. Of course, that is a line from the song, My Generation. Uh, he says, I hope I die before, before I get old. I get old. Um, what's the line preceding that? Um People try to put us down. down talking about my generation. When Just because they we get around. Get around talking about my generation. Things they do are uh, something, go, something, something always, so cold. Always go cold. Talking yeah. about my generation. Oh, hope I die before I get old. Talking about my generation. Wouldn't it be weird if there's a, a, a list of bands playing, like they were all playing a, a festival and the bands were listed and the DJ was reading out all the bands were playing? And he had to read. He had to read that the the were playing, and then the who. And, you'd be like, mm-hmm. and uh, closing the night, the two bands, the 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 who, <laughs> the 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 who. <laughs> All right, uh, why don't you read that last fun fact? Oh yeah, young Charlie tells his friend he's been around long enough to shill for Barnum. He's referring to Paul Thomas Barnum, known as PT an entertainer active in the mid-1800s, played by Hugh Jackman in the movie The Greatest Showman. That makes Charlie at least 190 years old at the time of this episode. Oh, five years older than you, Rich. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. What if, uh, again, belly full of laughs for this guy. So many laughs, so many facts, so many fun, so many mythology, so many, so much. So much. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Another fun episode. Yeah, we're back, man. We're back. We're glad to be back. Rob, glad to be back. There's Robbie. Hey, Robbie. You got Trey. He's here. You got uh, Bruce or Steve. The whole gang. We're all back. The original the lineup. Gang's back. Gang's back. Make sure you check us out on Patreon if you want to. If yeah, you want man. To become a member. You get a lot of uh, special goodies. Like you get watching a lot us. of. Might even get a photo of Petite Albert. I don't know. I don't know what we're doing these days. But <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. That's, a, that's, the highest, crowd. that's the highest level of uh, Patreons. Uh, anyway, thank you as always for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. Will do. This episode of Supernatural features Jared Padalecki as Sam Winchester and Jensen Ackles as Dean Winchester. Guest stars included Barry Boswick, Richard Libertini, John Rubenstein, Chris Burns, Jean Viev Cortese, Genevieve Cortese, Luke Camieri, and Michael Weston. Chris Angel is a Douchebag was written by Julie Siege, directed by Robert Singer, editing by Nicole Baer. Music by Christopher Lennertz. Executive produced by Eric Kripke and Robert Singer. The original broadcast of this episode featured the following songs. The Douchebag Theme by Christopher Lennertz and Steve Rangdakinis. This episode originally aired on January 22nd, 2009. This episode of Supernatural Then and Now was hosted and executive produced by Richard Spade Jr. and Rob Benedict. Produced by Stephen Hine. Written by Stephen Hine and Hayda Holscher. And edited and associate produced by Trey Booty. What's up, Booty? 
Music provided by Tim Wynn. The episode was recorded with the help of Sonic Fuel Studios. This podcast is from Story Mill Media. Follow the podcast on Instagram and whatever the hell they're calling Twitter these days at SPN Then and Now. And become a member of the podcast at worldwideweb.patreon.com slash SPN Then and Now. And then Van Morrison was reuniting his band, so it was the, 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 who, them. And the band. The band, the, the, it's not like somebody that's, stu- you know, a stutter, yeah. the record skipping. Yeah. The band, the, the, them, the who. Storybell Media. 